The best Sango Club meetings are always the domestic ones where one of our own speaks to us. Uh, and today we're very fortunate to have Sango and uh, Linda speak about the topic for which is celebrated uh, internationally. Uh, Sander uh, did his undergraduate work at, in Amsterdam and in a, coll a college in California. Then he did his PhD at MSE. He was at Princeton, um, was a, a visiting scholar at Yale, and now is a professor of social psychology in society here. He's a fellow of Churchill. His book, Foolproof, has won many prizes and awards. Um, he's so famous that it's inappropriate for me to give a long introduction. I just set him to go. <laughs> Thanks very much for that generous introduction, uh, John. Oh, yes, I should wear the, uh, the, the mic. Thanks very much. In fact, the, the last time um, I um, was kindly asked to, to give this lecture was when I just arrived in uh, seven, eight years ago now, 2017, I think, and um, I felt I didn't have uh, that, that much to say at, uh, at, um, at that point, so it's good to, uh, to be back after, uh, you know, seven, seven, eight years, and uh, hopefully I have a few more things to say on, uh, on this topic that might, uh, might interest folks. Um, 
So I always start off with a, a little quiz on this topic of uh, fake news and misinformation. I mean, we're, we're at Cambridge. Uh, we have a distinguished audience here of, uh, of uh, experts. Um, so two of the stories were all widely reported. Two of them are fake. So um, which of the um, following story is true? So raise your hand if you think that um, which one of these is true. So who would go for A, Putin issues international arrest warrant for George Soros? Who thinks that's true? Nobody? Okay, it's going to get increasingly ridiculous, right? So you're going to be a baby born in California was named Hard Eyes Emoji. Who thinks that's true? Okay, most people think that's true. Funnily enough, I was in California a couple of months ago and I did the same test, and most people in California also think that that's true. Um, so, um, C, criminal farts so loudly he gives away his hiding place. Okay. <laughs> De a, little too, a little too enthusiastic right there, Deborah. Um, um, uh, okay, but you, 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 read, you read the book. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So the, the two, cheating. So that, uh, that is actually true. This, uh, this really happened um, in uh, Missouri, I think. So this guy was uh, hiding out in the bushes and he passed gas so loudly he gave away his own uh, hiding place. And uh, the sheriff's department actually tweeted, when you're having a hashtag shit day, um, so, you know, it became a big Twitter joke. Um, but, um, you know, um, moving on from the fart jokes, it is a, it is a really uh, complicated question, actually, how to measure people's susceptibility to, um, to misinformation, as you can see from, from these tests. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit because, you know, all, all the questions I always get is, who, what is misinformation? Who determines what's misinformation? Who's fact-checking the fact-checkers? So I'll, I'll get into that in, uh, in a second. But... Um, you know, it dawned on us that um, there's actually no standardized psychometric instrument to measure these things. And so, you know, when people do research on this, they, they give people a bunch of headlines like this, and they ask which is true, which is false, um, and then the people get a score. But it's a bit unusual in psychology because, you know, we have scales to measure things. Clinical psychology has scales to measure things, uh, social psychology, personality psychology, right? Um, and so we actually didn't have a, a proper uh, test. So um, I won't bore you with this paper, which you can find in Behavior Research Methods, but it took us a couple of years to do, you know, tests and retesting. And, you know, people are a bit skeptical of this idea that um, you can get some sort of susceptibility to misinformation in news because news is always changing. And, you know, it is... It is uh, it doesn't work cross-culturally. You have to adapt it, right? Um, but we benchmarked it against the UK and uh, US uh, population norms in terms of how well people do. Um, so we spent a few years on this. I won't bore you with uh, item response theory uh, models of um, you know, how many dimensions this thing has. Um, but there's uh, lots of interesting techniques in here, too. This is an exploratory graph network. So he used social network theory and psychometrics, which is kind of new to see, um, you know, we had a, an AI generate tons and tons of items, hundreds of items. Um, turns out it's pretty uh, actually remarkable at uh, creating news headlines that seem plausible but are actually false. You know, dangerous vaccines loaded with toxins. Um, and so, um, you know, we had a human committee sort of uh, rate these to try to pare them down, but this is a, a social network graph to try to see the connection between all of the different items, which is a, a different way than item response theory to sort of look at these things. Um, this cluster is uh, real news, this is fake news, and this is particular kinds of fake news. And so we were able to pare it down to, to a test of about 20 uh, to 16, 16 and 20 items. Um, and that's public. You can take it online. It gives you a score of how discerning you are, but also how distrustful you are, how naive you are as a function of your response pattern. So if you just say fake news to everything, then you know, you're very distrusting. And if you believe everything, you're, you're more naive. And so it tries to give you a, a score. Um, but mainly, it's also a way for the field to have a standardized sort of measure. Um, now, I guess I don't have to tell people here about some of the consequences of misinformation and why is this an interesting topic, uh, practically speaking, um, not just theoretically of, you know, why, how do you measure such a thing. Um, over 50 phone masks in the UK have been set ablaze due to 5G conspiracies, right, that the coronavirus, um, 5G somehow uh, causes or exacerbates the coronavirus, which is false. Uh, not just the Western phenomenon. In Iran, um, hundreds of people have been hospitalized because they've read on social media that you know, ingesting methane would help cure the virus, including kids. Um, so quite scary. Um, here's a gentleman in, uh, in the U.S. saying that the vaccine will change your DNA. Um, what's, what's of interest to me is uh, not so much... Um, um, 
you know, even though sometimes on uh, social media I'm accused of uh, being the misinformation police, um, I'm not so much interested in specific claims, um, but rather the techniques that are used uh, throughout history to manipulate people. Um, and this, this one is really interesting to me because the mRNA vaccine is, of course, new. But with this whole idea, oh, there's a new technology and we don't know how it works and it's going to change your DNA and so on. Um, even though that seems uh, like a novel kind of misinformation, actually, if you go back to Edward Jenner, who came up with the first vaccine, um, he used cowpox to vaccinate people against uh, smallpox. Um, it turns out if you look at the propaganda from the 1800s, they actually used the exact same technique. Um, and so I'll show you uh, an actual photo um, with uh, humans, and then we have cows sprouting out of people's eyes and mouths. And the whole narrative here is that you were going to turn into a human-cow hybrid if you took the vaccine against smallpox. Um, and so actually what's happening is that they use the same manipulation techniques uh, throughout um, time and they just update them and, and change them ever so slightly um, when a new issue pops up. And it's kind of surprising that somehow people are duped by this uh, and don't realize that uh, these are the same playbooks that are recycled. Um, and one of our questions has been whether we can make people aware in advance of these tricks and inoculate them, um, irrespective of uh, telling people what's true or false. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this went viral in the UK. This is the disappeared needle. So if you get the vaccine, the needle actually disappears, um, which you know I hope mine was real. Um, so uh, here we have a military convoy heading to Ukraine. This is actually uh, Southern California. This went viral on Meta. This is a shallow fake, which is a cheap kind of, uh, kind of fake. Um, of course, we have Putin and his uh, Nazi claims. Uh, in the U.S., we have the Capitol riots of people actually storming the Capitol based on the false conspiracy that the election was stolen from Trump. Um, these, uh, uh, you know, I'm Dutch originally. Um, and it's an interesting case because a lot of people think that they're insulated from these sort of crazy U.S. conspiracy theories. But there was a, a bus full of people uh, in the Netherlands who went to this uh, funeral home and started digging up uh, bodies because they thought there were satanic pedophile ring uh, things happening in, uh, in the graveyard. And uh, this, these were QAnon people. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a busload of people, Dutch people, who became convinced that um, there were satanic rituals happening. Uh, in this uh, funeral home, which was, uh, of course, very sad and, uh, and disturbing. Um, but as some people say, the, the sort of satanic panic from the 80s is, is back uh, in, uh, in, in many forms. Of course, Israel Hamas, uh, lots of manipulated imagery online, um, some of it taken from video games like Armor Shooter 3, uh, totally fake stuff, uh, hard for people to discern. So, you know, there's tons and tons more. But uh, what do I mean by misinformation? So I'll, I'll clarify it. And, you know, I'm speaking to a room of, of, of what I think are mostly psychologists, so um, it's, it's not that um, surprising. But, but actually, it's quite interesting when you give this talk to the public or for philosophers or people um, who, um, um, you know, who, who have different ideas about definitions. Uh, but for me, misinformation is either information that's false or, or uh, misleading. And this is actually quite important because some people define misinformation strictly as things that are false, um, some as misleading. Um, but I led an APA consensus report on what the definition should be for, at least for psychologists. And um, this was a very difficult report. Um, I don't think I'll ever do a consensus report again, with, uh, um, uh, even though I love my colleagues uh, in, in the field. It's, uh, you know, everyone has different opinions. It's actually quite difficult to get, to get to a consensus. But we were in agreement that it should be false or misleading to allow for, you know, different kind of uh, research traditions. Also, because if we start talking about how big of a problem misinformation is, it actually depends on the definition. If you define misinformation as stuff that's purely fabricated, like, you know, flat earth, then actually it's not that big of a problem. But in terms of the quantitative estimates of how prevalent it is in people's feeds, um, but if you define it as misleading information or biased information, now all of a sudden we're talking about a huge problem. Um, and so that actually matters quite a bit. So we're kind of saying both uh, disinformation is misinformation with some psychological intention to actually deceive or harm other people, right? So misinformation could just be an error, right? It's not intentional, uh, but disinformation is intentional. And then propaganda is disinformation in the service of some political cause or agenda. And that can be institutionalized or, or not. We kind of stopped using the term fake news because it's so politicized that it really doesn't mean anything anymore at this point. So we kind of like to differentiate between these various terms. And here in the uh, consensus report, we say that um, you know, the extent to which a headline 
um, shows evidence of manipulation, regardless of the article's source, its intent, or whether it has been fact-checked. So the problem in practice is, you know, proving intent legally is actually quite difficult. So there are documented cases where people have tried to dupe others, and there's legal evidence of that. For example, for example, the tobacco industry, or the fossil fuel industry, uh, or or um, you know the opioid crisis uh, in the U.S., for example. Um, but it's hard to, you know, on everyday sort of claims, it's hard to demonstrate intent. Um, the source issue is another very interesting one. So a lot of people are all about teaching the right sources, which you know can be helpful. But I think we also have to be cognizant of the fact that in modern democracies, maybe maybe source sources work in terms of this is a good source, this is a bad source. But um, you know it's not so clear uh, if you scale this up internationally, uh, who decides what's uh, what's a good source, what's a bad source? Is it a government? Is it not a government? It depends on do people like the government? Do they not like the government? Right? And so we we actually feel it's safest. Um, to talk about information regardless of, of the source or the intention and just focus on is it false or misleading, um, which can be determined by fact-checking and scientific consensus and known characteristics of deceptive or epistemologically dubious content, right? Presenting opinions as facts or logical fallacies, things that have been true for over 2,000 years in terms of what's, sh what's shady and what's not. Um, and so... Um, even though some people attempt an infinite regress with this, like, okay, what's, who's fact-checking the fact-checkers and is there truth? Um, there's a sort of larger attack on the notion of truth, which, you know, I'm not a philosopher, um, but, but I think it's somewhat disingenuous because there's a, a very long history of establishing standards for uh, inquiry um, and pretending that those don't exist, I think, is, uh, is, uh, is another matter. Um, and so basically that's what we focus on. So let me give you some practical examples of why this matters. And so if you do a, a study... Um, you look at the stuff that's been fact-checked from uh, Snopes or PolitiFact, right? So either it's true or it's false, and those are your stimuli in the psychology experiments. That's one way. Another is to look at the source or the publisher. So they're actually known lists of dubious uh, sources. So, for example, NewsGuard uh, here in the UK rates every major news website in terms of how credible or trustworthy they are. And so you can use the source as a proxy. There's two issues with these definitions. I think it's fine for, for research. We just have to be cognizant of the fact that they have limitations, right? Most news isn't fact-checked, and the process by which things get selected for fact-checking is not always very transparent. So they tend to focus on the obviously false things, which is, uh, which is fine, but it's actually just a sliver of, uh, of all the stuff that's out there. Um, sometimes influential sources can also publish misinformation, which is much more damaging than some, some crank website that nobody reads. Um, so when, you know... To give a few counterexamples, you know, the New York Times published uh, tons of misinformation about the war in Iraq, uh, you know, that weapons of mass destruction had been found even though there was no evidence uh, of that, and they later apologized for that. Um, the BBC, uh, up until a couple years ago, uh, well, more than a couple years ago now, was sort of pushing the false balance on climate change by always having, you know, a few contrarians uh, um, commenting, even though there was really no reason for that. Um, and they also apologize for that and change the editorial practices. But just to say that influential sources can make mistakes, uh, um, and if they have good er editorial standards, they'll fix those mistakes. Um, but that can be much more influential. So we focus on the presence or absence of these manipulation techniques. And so I don't want to go too much into this sort of simplistic thinking of true or false, because most things in reality have shades of gray. Um, so we want to help people identify media manipulation more, more generally. So let me give you a practical example. Vitamin C protects against coronavirus. This has been fact-checked as false. Health Impact News is also a fake news website, okay? So that's easy uh, in terms of a stimuli that you can say that's, that's fine. But now let, let me give you another one. A healthy doctor died two weeks after getting COVID vaccine. CDC is investigating why. The Chicago Tribune is a highly respectable outlet in the U.S. If you look up the ratings, they're highly factual, okay? So by the source, this is not fake news. Uh, this was also not fact-checked as false because a healthy doctor did die two weeks after getting the COVID vaccine. However, it's clear that a manipulation technique is being used, which is a known fallacy uh, to imply causation where there's only correlation, uh, right? So the headline is framed in such a way that the causation, a causal pattern is implied here, even though it was only correlational. In fact, there was no evidence at the time that the two things had anything to do with each other. But you can construct the headline in such a way that it misleads people. Um, and, and it's true that the CDC investigated it because they have to investigate all, all of these uh, types of reports. Um, but certainly this was widely deemed misleading. An article just came out that looked at Facebook, uh, misinformation on Facebook. Uh, this is in uh, 
uh, final stages with nature, I think. Um, but basically what they say is that the, the impact of misinformation, like obvious like false stuff, was 50 times less than that of content not flagged by fact checkers that nonetheless expressed vaccine skepticism. So stuff that has some, some grain of legitimacy but is otherwise misleading is much more damaging to public opinion uh, than outright false stuff. So that's kind of the background of why I focus on um, uh, manipulation and misleading this more than, than sort of debunking um, you know, flat earth and QAnon um, conspiracies. Okay, so if you look at what um, research is out there, you know, one of the main responses uh, is debunking and, and fact-checking. And uh, again, I'm not, sometimes people you know, misinterpret what I'm saying here, which is I'm not saying that debunking and fact-checking is bad. I actually think it's good, uh, but we just know that its efficacy is, is limited for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that once people are exposed to misinformation, they often continue to retrieve false details from memory even after having acknowledged uh, that a correction um, has been published. So in experiments, you, you can actually do this pretty easily. So you, you give people a story with some details, and then later you say, oh, there was a fire in a warehouse. And then later you say, actually, the fire wasn't the cause of the warehouse. This is a correction. And then you test people, but they continue to retrieve causal details about the fire from memory, um, even though... Uh, it has been corrected. And so this is called the continued influence effect of misinformation, which is extremely pervasive and, and very difficult to get rid of. Uh, in, the in, you know, in the legal sphere, they have a saying, you can't unring a bell. Um, and and some of that's somewhat true for misinformation. You can reduce its influence, uh, but not eliminate it very easily. There's also a practical issue. So fact checks just don't scale. Okay, fact checks don't go viral. If you look at the, the research on this, uh, people don't engage with fact checks in the same way as misinformation goes viral. Um, and the diffusion patterns are very different because fact checks are not shocking. They're not highly emotional. Uh, they're not uh, novel, uh, right? So fact checks tend to be complex, long, neutral, boring. Um, and so nobody clicks on that. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a big problem in terms of it's an asymmetrical sort of race. If you look at the example from the tobacco industry, you know, they were court ordered in uh, 2007 um, by a U.S. court to run a correction campaign that uh, they had legal documentation that for 50 years they had deliberately tried to manipulate public opinion on the link between smoking and disease with this information. Um, and so they ran a correction campaign. But you know, one correction campaign that a, a, a sliver of the population sees against 50 years of propaganda is, of course, no, no match. Um, and so that is, the, you know, that is what, we're, um, uh, what we're facing. A new meta-analysis just came out in Nature Human Behavior that uh, said, uh, on average, uh, attempts to debunk science relevant misinformation were unsuccessful. Um, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in this meta-analysis, so I think you can debunk successfully. Um, but um, it's hard. Um, so if you want to know why, uh, there's some, uh, some interesting uh, fMRI research on this. There's basically like two competing uh, accounts for this. Uh, one's called the integration error account, which is that people don't link the correction to the myth in memory, and so they don't integrate it into their mental model of how something works. And the second is a retrieval error. So, you know, we store correct and incorrect uh, information concurrently in memory. Uh, and so you have to suppress the misinformation when, when, uh, during retrieval. Um, and sometimes uh, that process goes wrong. Um, if you're interested, there's a bunch of, uh, of studies on this. I mean, they're, they're typically small sample and, and, and somewhat inconclusive. Um, you know, one study looked at the... Uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, prenucleus as a, as a, you know being involved uh, when you know less activity when um, when there's a retraction uh, present versus non-retraction, um, which kind of extended into the uh, um, um, cingulated uh, gyrus. But but you know other studies don't find that, and so it's yeah you know, I find it kind of difficult to know what to make of that. Um, I think both can be true at the uh, at the same time. So in the sense that sometimes we fail to retrieve the correction and sometimes we fail to integrate it into memory uh, and I think the bottom line for practitioners is the same. Um, the problem is that when you're debunking you're often repeating the misinformation uh, and so you make it more prominent in people's memory and so people fail to integrate the correction or they fail to retrieve the correction because the myth is much more prominent uh, and, and you know if you think of memory as a network right with nodes and links and the more you repeat the link the stronger uh, it becomes and, and the correction tends to be long and complex right 
right? And so it's not easily digestible. Sometimes people don't want the correction because it's not politically congenial for some reason. So there are lots of people, lots of ways for people to resist the correction um, and, and continue to rely on the initial misinformation. We also know that if you don't provide an alternative, people just go back to relying on the initial misinformation even when they know it's wrong uh, because, you know, people want to know what's true instead. So for all of these reasons, um, we start focusing on the idea of pre-bunking rather than debunking um, to try to sort of build preemptive resilience. Uh, what is pre-bunking? So it follows the theory of psychological inoculation. Uh, so what is inoculation? Uh, Bill McGuire, who was a um, psycho social psychologist uh, at Yale in the 1960s, first came up with this idea. This is a reprint that's no longer in circulation from Psychology Today, in which they covered some of his research with uh, some interesting artwork from the 60s. Um, and um, his idea that he never really tested uh, on propaganda, but I think the idea was brilliant, uh, was that you would expose people to a weakened dose of uh, the virus or an inactivated strain, like with the vaccine, so that the body generates antibodies, or the immune system generates antibodies to help confer resistance against future infection. And he said you can do the same with information, expose people to a weakened dose of, of misinformation or the techniques used to produce misinformation and refute it in advance or deconstruct it in advance for people so they build up mental or cognitive resistance to the full dose of misinformation uh, later on. And uh, we even go as far as saying these antibodies, we can actually measure the mental antibodies. So how resistant are people? How many counter arguments can they come up with? How motivated are they to resist? Uh, how well can they spot manipulation? Um, and so this analogy has been developed uh, um, um, quite a bit. Um, in fact, uh, people lost interest after the 60s. Um, he developed this so that actually the context for this was really interesting. So uh, just very briefly, he, um, during the Korean War uh, in the U.S., about one British national and 19 U.S. soldiers uh, voluntarily stayed behind in then communist uh, China. Uh, and the U.S. was paranoid that these soldiers had been brainwashed by Chinese uh, soldiers uh, into, you know, thinking that communism, communism was a great thing and they should abandon capitalism. And of course, in reality, something else happened. For example, there was a lot of racism in the U.S. and the soldiers didn't really want to go back to the U.S. But, but they didn't know that at the time. And so at the time, the narrative was that they had been brainwashed, that soldiers are vulnerable to brainwashing by foreign troops, and that somehow we need to be able to, to, to prevent people from being brainwashed. And the U.S. government wanted to instill more facts in the soldiers about why is America great? You know, can you, can you name 10 facts about why America is, you know, is, is so nice? Um, and McGuire said that's actually the wrong approach. People don't need more facts. What they, the problem was they had no mental defenses against the types of questions that they, that they were facing from these soldiers. Right? They, they couldn't generate uh, any resistance. Um, and so what they need is a simulation of the types of attacks that they might be facing um, and then give them the resistance and the counter arguments they need to withstand future persuasion attempts. And that's really what, what brought on the idea of inoculation. Um, now, psychologically, people debate about these elements. So there's the refutational preemption. I've relabeled that a pre-bunk many years ago because it's easier for people to understand. So you preemptively refute uh, future misinformation. And then there's also the warning. Um, and so the warning in the vaccine analogy, it's sort of your body needs to be aware of a potential invader. Um, and so same with the brain, right? It's sleeping most of the time in terms of its... Uh, um, you know, deception monitoring. Um, and so somehow we need to alert the brain that uh, we might be manipulated. Um, and that's done through a, an explicit kind of warning. Um, some people say that's effective and cognitive. I mean, the dual process people really don't agree on this. Um, and you can get emotional responses from the weakened dose or the pre-bunk, uh, which is actually supposed to, you know, the weakened dose is supposed to stimulate your defenses, like you're being challenged by, by faulty information. Uh, but you can also do that explicitly through, uh, through a warning. Um, now, I'm not going to go into all the lab experiments that we did on this using the, the exact sort of laboratory paradigm that, you know, it turns out it's true. You can take any issue, uh, you take an issue, you know, uh, that's, that's false, then you expose people to a weakened dose and you refute it in advance and people build up uh, resistance. But then we got the same questions from, uh, from journalists about how do you scale this, right? You can't pre-bunk every single myth. Um, you know, how, how does this work in the real world? You know, people kind of come into the lab and you give them the pre-bunk and then uh, we're all saved from misinformation, right? So, so we started thinking about, okay, how can we do translational research? So we have these lab experiments, but, but how would you do this in the real world? And so um, 
You know, we got some funny news headlines. Uh, this was about a climate change experiment. LA Times says it's possible to vaccinate Americans specifically against uh, fake news. Um, um, turns out um, Americans did need some, uh, some vaccinating against uh, you know, misinformation about global warming uh, at the time. Uh, but it sort of turned into this general narrative. Cambridge scientists consider fake news vaccine. One journalist called and asked if this was fake news. Um, so I said, you know, you read the study and you tell us. Um, what you think. But the idea really was uh, to turn this into a, a game. Um, and so I thought one way uh, to uh, get public engagement with this approach and to do this on a much larger scale is to actually turn this into a gamified uh, intervention. Um, we took some, there, there was, somebody at Cambridge started this joke about our lab being the, uh, the defense against the dark arts. Uh, this was before the, the whole J.K. Rowling uh, issue. Um, but um, um, I will say this is my ode to Alan Rickman more than anything. Um, but the, the, the idea really was that I think it was one of the libraries. Um, and so it was kind of funny. But the more I thought about it, the more I actually thought that there is something to this analogy. Because Severus Snape did say your defenses must be as flexible and inventive as the arts that you seek to undo. Um, and you know, when we think about our response to misinformation, we're stuck with this fact-checking and you know, very formal responses. And I thought, you know, the dark arts of manipulation are changing, right? Deep fakes, AI. So so does our response to, to the science and how we actually do this. So we created this game called Bad News. Uh, bad News was kind of a joke. Uh, and the idea was actually to put people in a simulation, you know, thinking about Maguire's original concept. Uh, we put people in a simulation engine where they're exposed to weakened doses of the more general techniques that are used to dupe people uh, online. Um, so getting away from specific issues uh, and actually looking. So for a couple of years, we actually we interviewed people who worked in Russian, in Russian troll farms, people who were former neo-Nazis, extremists. Um, uh, we read lots of intelligence reports. And so we came up with this list of, uh, of these sort of general tactics that are used. Um, and we wanted to inoculate people against them. So what's bad news? Um, say this was John Rosenbeek's idea. So John Rosenbeek was a PhD student then first year um, and he had this idea of, uh, he, he read some of our lab papers and he said, uh, okay, great, uh, inoculation, but maybe we should do a, a game so it's not so boring. Um, and so I said, okay, um, well, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, and the question was, how could we incorporate this inoculation aspect? And so we built a simulation engine um, that is, at the time was like Twitter. Um, and your goal is to gain as many followers as possible without losing any credibility. So here you are, after long deliberation with my generals, have decided to declare war in North Korea, hashtag Kim Jong Un. Um, so this is what Donald Trump is uh, tweeting in the game. This is not something Donald Trump said, but maybe could have said. Um, but the point is that we manipulated the Twitter handle. So most people actually fail to notice that this is uh, an N instead of uh, an M, right? So people think this is coming from uh, Trump. So impersonation has lots of uh, different ways. So you can impersonate celebrities, fake doctors, or politicians. Um, so you tweet this, uh, for a political balance here we have Joe Biden, as your president have issued an executive order to rename Canada to North North Dakota, hashtag you got annexed. Um, and uh, you know, again, a little wiggle here on the, on the end, right, so s same technique. Um, so you tweet this, uh, the mainstream media has one massive conspiracy, hashtag fake news, I mean, we all know that. Um, here you're impersonating NASA, canceling Sponge, SpongeBob, causing outrage. So, you know, it's all fictional. So it's the weekend sort of dose using humor so that we're not duping anyone. Um, but uh, it's based actually on, on reality, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. And so it's very interactive. And so you get points and people respond to you. You create your own echo chamber and, and filter bubble. Um, so here are the six techniques. Polarization, right? writing us versus them type of headlines, polarizing groups in society, impersonating doctors and politicians, celebrities, using conspiracy theories or conspiratorial reasoning to cast doubt on the mainstream, trolling during elections, harassing people and trolling them with fake information, um, using uh, the appeal to emotion fallacy. Uh, so, you know, emotions in general are obviously fine, but on social media, what you often see is that people use fallacious arguments, you know, like, oh, here's a, a crying baby, you shouldn't get the vaccine. Um, so, so the idea is that, uh, that you know, basically, you know, it's, it's the, the fallacious use of emotions to deceive people, and then discrediting and using doubt campaigns and denial tactics uh, and so on. 
Um, and then you move up, and then you know eventually uh, you, you become a master of disinformation. That's really the uh, the uh, the joke in uh, in the game. Um, so here's an example of a meme in the game. Uh, you know, apparently I was ruining the planet, keeping my baby warm. Um, and so this is about spreading denial about climate change. And so right, so so the idea of using energy to keep your baby warm uh, has nothing to do with fighting climate change, uh, but it is it is emotional. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff in the game comes from uh, research that we do. For example, the language that's used by conspiracy theorists online. So, you know, we look at the timelines and we analyze using uh, linguistic analyses to see what terms they use. And so, you know, they're very angry, obviously, and anxious. And, you know, they use a lot of words related to power and death and religion. Um, and so, uh, you know, here you can create your own conspiracy theory in the game. Uh, juice boxes are laced with LSD to keep us subdued. Um, but actually, if you, if you, if you, this is funny, but if you tweet this, the, the, the narrator says no, no, uh, because it's uh, easily uh, debunked by people. So you have to be a bit smarter about your conspiracy theories. Um, schools no longer teach cursive, so kids can't read the Communist Manifesto. Um, and again, John uh, Rosenbeek, I blame for all of the humor in, uh, in the game. Um, so uh, the best words, uh, you know, what a stupid story. I just drank a sip of juice and guess what? Still not hallucinating. Hashtag idiots. Um, and so this is actually signaling that a lot of conspiracy theories, they play on reality. So if you come up with something ridiculous, nobody's going to believe you. And so that's not what a propagandist would do, right? And so that's kind of the, uh, the idea. Um, so then we're impersonating the WHO about COVID and, um, you know, bioweapons. Uh, you're drawing a missing airliner. So this is based on reality, right? So there was actually a missing airliner. Um, and then, you know, you can draw your stuff and say, oh, I, you know, I find the connections here. Um, and so, you know, you get your badge and you move on. Um, the Trump example actually comes from somebody impersonating Warren Buffett on Twitter. Uh, so there's a T missing, right? So same tactic. Gained hundreds of thousands of followers in minutes. Was tweeting out like, mm, invest in what makes you happy. Total nonsense. Um, but, it, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it happens. So how do we test people? So A, we wanted the research community to have uh, a more realistic way of assessing people. So we actually put people in a social media simulation and then they're presented with social media-like posts. And again, I'm not interested is this true or false because a lot of this stuff is, is more complex, but we want to know whether how reliable it is as a function of the manipulation that's happening. So this was many years ago during the, uh, you know, the end of Game of Thrones, which you know, I was very disappointed by. But, but uh, this is total, total fake news, uh, but it uses the same technique, right? So different example, but, but same technique. Um, this is Johnson crude oil trolling Leo DiCaprio. Could do something like global warming uh, you're always going on about. Um, um, so this is uh, uh, kind of a joke about uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. We had one uh, postdoc in the lab who worked on uh, that movie, uh, you know, Don't Look Up um, with Leo, and they did some climate campaign. Um, and so, um, we thought we'd make fun of Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, and so here, uh, conspiracy, you know, BBC's doing an apology because there's microchips in the upcoming vaccines uh, and so on. So that's sort of how we test people. And here's John Rosenbeek with the beautiful hair, if you hadn't seen him. Um, um, and so we had, a, you know, we had a, basically a, a fuel experiment. So this thing went viral uh, online unexpectedly on Reddit and corners of the Internet. Um, and so, you know, before this, we were actually going into schools, you know, doing field experiments uh, with students. Uh, uh, the problem is uh, students don't always show up to class, uh, uh, right? And, uh, you know, messing up our randomization in the control versus the, the treatment group. Uh, you know, it took, it took a long time and, you know, it was, it was paper-based. It was a board game. It didn't have a social media element. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to move into the digital age. Um, and so that's why we, we, we did this game. Um, this is a very simple experiment. So this, you know, we just embedded some items, pre and post, within subject. Uh, some of them were true, some of them were misleading, and then we asked people how reliable they are. So we have about 30,000 data points, so 15,000 paired responses uh, when this thing went viral. So people opt into the research, right? So you can see here on the items that are neutral, you know, pre-post, people didn't change at all. But then for the items that uh, use these techniques, people found them significantly uh, less reliable. In fact, it didn't matter if you were left or right or young or old or lower or higher educated. I mean, people start at different baselines, which is another story, uh, but the intervention effect um, was pretty much consistent. There were some minor differences. It's significant because it's a huge sample size, but, but practically uh, it, it really wasn't. Um, of course, there were lots of issues with the study, right? So uh, um, it takes a lot of cloud uh, in the game to host the, the game. So uh, you can't ask people too many questions because it disturbs the gaming experience, and also uh, it takes up a lot of space, and we didn't have 
you know, a lot of uh, money at the time. Um, um, and so uh, we decided to redo, also I didn't have a control group, right? I didn't have a randomized control group. So we decided to add a randomized control group uh, and to have, uh, you know, a much larger set of items. Maybe we were just lucky with the items, right? Maybe we asked people the, you know, some easy items and that's why they're differentiated uh, and, and it hadn't to do with our game. Um, so now we had 18 items, so there's six badges, so three items for every badge, so we have some basic reliability, so 18 items, and we added a control group where people play Tetris. So this game actually takes 20 minutes, so we got lots of prolific messages asking if we're really paying people to play Tetris for 20 minutes, but yes, if you're in a control group, then that's what the money was going. Um, and Melissa, who was one of our GATE students, had this really good idea about confidence. So she said, you know, one of the problems is that if you're not very confident in your own truth to sermon abilities, you're easily persuaded. Uh, by what people might tell you. And so we wanted to see if the game also boosts uh, confidence. So here's the result for reliability. So again, on average, control group, nothing happening. The density here is around zero. And then uh, for the inoculation, people find the, the stuff less reliable, so density shifts to the left. But also we found that it boosts people's uh, confidence uh, in their own abilities. And that was only true if people updated in the right direction. There were a few jokers in this data set, uh, that, uh, a few data points that you can see where, where people are just going in a different direction. But you know, we're talking about averages. Um, and so this was true, that if you updated correctly, people became more uh, confident. Um, now, by this time, people said, okay, cool, you have a game, you can inoculate people, um, but how long does it really last? Because, you know, we know psychology. Um, 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 and so um, we said, right, so, you know, does it last an hour, you know, a day, uh, a year? So Lacoon, who is now at Oxford uh, on a JRF, uh, made this his PhD topic uh, and really started systematically mapping the, uh, the, the uh, kind of decay curve of, you know, people's memory of, uh, of this uh, the type of intervention. So we did the same, uh, same trial, um, and I'm going to walk through it once because it's always the same type of experiment. So we give people a pretest, 18 items, yeah? Then we randomize them to inoculation or control. Then we started following up with people week after week after week for about four months. Uh, in the inoculation literature, it's called an attack, which is a bit, sounds a bit nefarious, but basically you present people with misinformation again and again and again to see how resistant they are at different time points. Same experiment, cut out all the intermediate testing, just follow up people at the end. And then one of the reviewers was like, what are people just remembering their answers to, because you're giving them the same items? And so I said, okay, I barely remember what I had for dinner last night. But let's assume that people are remembering 18 items at every testing period. So we switched out the items at every testing period. Um, so by the way, this is all in the OSF and pre-registered, and you know, people can play around with it. Um, so basically, uh, what's happening here, um, Here's the intervention effect. Again, these are densities, right? Left means less reliable. Um, but this lasted for about three to four months. And so I said to Raccoon, I mean, that's not really possible. I mean, you know, even with COVID, people need booster shots. Um, and so, you know, find me, find me decay. Because, um, um, you know, this, this doesn't seem plausible. Um, and so Raccoon was like, well, but, you know, the data says that uh, it's still there after three months. But we were like, well, yeah, okay. But um, um, I just, you know, we were expecting... Also, his PhD was about decay, so, so you know, not having any decay is not convenient for the PhD. So I was like, okay, we're, we're, we're motivated. Um, no, but really, you know, there was a, um, it, it just didn't seem like that would happen, right? And so, in fact, in our second experiment, um, the decay the became more, uh, you know, more noticeable. So this is at the end of the testing period. There's still a difference between treatment and control, but you can see here people find misinformation more reliable again. So it's actually, you know, this is about a 50, 60 percent decay of the original effect size. Um, and so it turns out, something we later confirmed, is that in the condition where you don't follow up with people and just go at the end, um, you're actually boosting people in between by quizzing them. Um, and it turns out there's actually two uh, processes that underlie why inoculation wears off over time. There's, there's a motivational account and there's a memory-based account. So either people lose motivation to want to defend themselves or they actually forget um, some of the inoculation material. And the quiz actually helps boost both uh, unintentionally. Um, it doesn't have to be a quiz. It could be a video. It could be re-administering the treatment. Turns out you can boost people in, in lots of ways. And so Raccoon actually set out to try to disentangle this uh, systematically over time. And so we have this sort of threat motivation model, which is really about um, boosting 
increasing people's motivation by kind of threatening them with the idea of misinformation. Then there's the memory model, which is just about boosting people's memory. And here's our integrated model. So in social psychology, people basically say, look, this is all about motivation, you know, uh, memory, shmemory. Uh, and so, you know, people need to, it's about identity. Uh, and then the cognitive science people are like, hmm, no, this is just a memory problem. Basically, this is 100% a memory problem. Um, and so we, we said, okay, let's do an integrative account. Um, because my, our thinking was that, look, if I'm not motivated to remember something, uh, that's a big deal, right? So maybe memory is a, a leading sort of factor, but you also have to be motivated to, to actually memorize something. Um, and so um, I'm not going to bore you with, uh, with uh, too many details here, but Raccoon basically did every, every type of inoculation you can do with text, with videos, with games, and then he did it over time, long enough to map out a kind of memory curve. Um, this is also, I should say, uh, with John Simons in the department who uh, contributed greatly to our understanding of um, all the different ways in which we can measure people's memory. Um, and so we had lots of different ways to, to actually do this. Um, and it turns out that uh, one way or another, uh, the memory uh, factor explains about 41% of the variation in the decay of, of all types of inoculations. Um, so that's, that's a big amount, and that's the leading factor. And motivation came in second, different types of motivations. Um, and then all of this other stuff that's been raised as potentials actually had, had very little effect. Um, and here's a structural equation model. Um, putting this all together, what you actually find is that motivation is important for predicting memory of the material, but it's actually the memory that leads to improved discernment 30 days later after the, uh, the intervention. Um, and actually, you can boost people's memory pretty easily, but we were completely unsuccessful at boosting people's motivation. Um, well, we, we found no effect, which either means that it's not important or we failed to manipulate it correctly. But we've we manipulated it about five, six different times um, and so far haven't, haven't found a, a big sort of direct uh, role. Okay, so then we started working with the, uh, the UK government um, who said, look, uh, we're interested in promoting media literacy around the world. Let us help you uh, translate this intervention, which they did. And so they translated it into pretty much every major language around the world. And so we could do big cross-cultural studies. Um, you know, the takeaway from that and bad news in different countries is that in Western Europe, it's all pretty similar, uh, but there's big differences uh, the further out you go. So, uh, you know, we've, we've actually completely failed in uh, places like rural India, where even with adaptation, it's proving extremely difficult to, to, to try to, to, to make this intervention work because, you know, the contextual understanding is so different. I mean, the, uh, the idea of hypothetically rating news items is just not something that people do. Um, and so we have to invent a completely different task for that purpose. Um, whereas, you know, in, in, let's say, Germany or Greece, it's actually pretty similar to, to what's happening in, uh, in the UK. Um, here's an example from Sweden with our Swedish collaborator uh, who's an educational psychologist who does this in classrooms. Um, so one of the interesting things for us is that, you know, uh, researchers in different countries, they use their own stimuli, right? And so they take our method, but they invent their own stimuli with their own manipulation that's relevant to local context. So we can actually see how well this approach generalizes. Um, and so here, uh, you know, students did it in pairs, individually or in class, didn't really matter. Basically, there's a, about a, a 0.3, uh, that's the effect size, that's pretty standard of uh, finding misinformation less credible after playing the game, pre and post. So that replicates pretty well. And then students also found you know, neutral posts more reliable after playing. This effect size is small because it varies across different types of trials. You know, we don't educate people about good sources and how to be a good journalist. So sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's small, sometimes it's slightly negative. Um, but you know, the, the big thing for us is that we're helping people spot uh, manipulation. Um, we did some qualitative work too where you actually see that people focus less on the content um, from pre to post and more on the strategy. So this doubles actually, so people are paying more attention to manipulative strategies. And we're not really changing people's source heuristic, which is kind of what we want. I mean, you know, it's fine for people to rely on sources, but we don't want to tell people what are, what are good sources, what are bad sources. Um, so that's kind of where we are. People in India did this study, again, had no idea, fascinating. Um, and so using their own headlines, there was a direct uh, registered replication of our initial study. They found the exact same result uh, with pretty much identical effect sizes. Also, you know, kind of surprising in the control group, people find real news more reliable, um, even though we don't provide that training. So, you know, it's, uh, that's interesting. But mostly, uh, you know, there were some slight differences, but mostly the same. I think the difference with our research is that, you know, we're doing things in rural India with really low literacy levels in collaboration with social media companies, whereas this is at an at a urban center at a higher educational institute uh, in, in India where, you know, 
first language is, is, is also English. So the urban-rural distinction actually seems to matter a lot. Um, there was a meta-analysis that came out of this whole literature recently, finding that, you know, on average, uh, these approaches help, uh, it, you know, improve people's discernment of uh, reliable versus unreliable content. They, they included a moderator for the Shady Rosenbeck and Van der Linden uh, uh, studies because we were cluttering the, the, the literature. But it turns out actually that our effect sizes were on the lower end of what, what other people are estimating. So, so it's, it's actually good to see that our estimates are, are more conservative. Um, I'm going to skip through this a little bit because um, I want to get to the, uh, the end of the talk. Um, you know, there, uh, there's a debate about, um, you know, how skeptical you want to make people. So some people have told us, uh, look, uh, you know, focusing on all this manipulation can, can make people a little too skeptical maybe of, uh, of, uh, of, of legitimate news that's also kind of clickbaity, but uh, maybe people shouldn't be, you know, our philosophical argument is actually different. So if, if the BBC uses a clickbait headline, then, then the goal of our intervention is to make people more skeptical of that clickbait headline, regardless of whether it's the BBC or not. Some people say we should give, we should give in this case, we should give people a break because it's the BBC. Um, and so, you know, the question is how skeptical do you want to make people? So one of the things, um, so if you look at some of the work on learning and memory, feedback, uh, you know, kind of like with vaccines actually. So the, the way your body, you know, differentiates uh, foreign invaders that are harmful versus, you know, local cells is through feedback mechanisms. And I think similarly, you know, with, uh, with, with the mind in some ways, uh, people need feedback to distinguish between pairs of stimuli. Um, and so we started to implement a little feedback in all of our games where we basically, if people, if the game notices a responding pattern that's basically just distrustful of everything, we're prompting people and say, look, you know, even Freud said sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, uh, right? You have to actually pay attention uh, to, to, to what's manipulative and what's not. And that, that hugely boosts people's ability to differentiate. And so there's actually three different ways that you can tune our games. You can, you can tune them to spot misinformation, you can tune them to spot real information or discernment between the two. And scholars actually disagree on the importance of these three factors. And so we can, you know, it's like a dial. So we can dial it up, we can dial it down, uh, depending on people's preferences. Um, um, this is uh, something called signal detection theory, which is uh, a framework that's often used in cognitive uh, psychology and uh, psychophysics, uh, which is basically about you know, plotting the false positive uh, rate against the hit rate of how good people are. One of the things you see is that with feedback, you see this curve here, which bends towards the, uh, the left corner. Um, so this is basically a classifier. So if you treat this whole exercise as a classifier, how good are people at classifying true versus false content, you can improve uh, classification through uh, through feedback. That's kind of the, the short story. So we have a version for kids. We did one during the pandemic with uh, uh, the UK government called Go Viral. It was a five-minute version, um, and we were lucky to be part of the United Nations and the World Health Organization's official campaign. Uh, this was about pandemic misinformation. So at, at the start of the pandemic, the government called us and said, look, all this is misinformation. What do we do? So we said, uh, not whatever you're currently doing. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's inoculate uh, people against misinformation information and I thought they were never going to go for that but then I got the head of uh, UK government communications and said okay let's do it um, and so then we actually had to pivot uh, all of our resources and so we developed this game called go viral which is five minutes and inoculates against conspiracy theories fear-mongering fake experts you know impersonating doctors and things like that um, this actually went on to, to be the second most viewed page at the World Health Organization's COVID, uh, uh, COVID sub area. So we had 200 million people who went through this uh, uh, in intervention. Um, um, of course, we also tested it. Um, same as, as bad news, but now, you know, here's Joe Will, and he joins a WhatsApp group called Not Co Afraid. Um, and then, um, you know, he said, Liz lizard people are behind coronavirus. Um, and so, you know, live virus particles found in terrariums. Um, Again, you know, we did some randomized control trials also against the government's uh, or the UN's ongoing campaign, and we actually found that it outperformed the, the, uh, the, the default campaign that they were running at the, uh, at the time. Um, but more importantly, we actually found that the games elicited more motivation from people to defend themselves uh, than some of the other interventions, and people were more willing to share the game than some of the infographic type stuff that the government uh, usually does, um, or, or kind of these... Uh, uh, educational campaigns that are, that are, that are the default. So, so that was positive news. We did stuff with, um, during the previous election with Homeland Security in the US, 
Um, the idea was to defend the U.S. from foreign propaganda. So we created a game called Harmony Square. Uh, this is Chris Krebs, who was fired by Trump while we were working on this uh, for debunking Trump's election-related fraud claims. Um, so, you know, Trump said the election was stolen, and Chris said, I'm in charge of the election, and I can tell you it was safe and secure, no foreign interference at least, and then Trump fired him. Um, and so uh, what happened was, though, that we created this game with, uh, with Chris uh, during the, uh, with his team during the election to help people spot foreign influence. And we did that using a pineapple analogy. So thinking about weakened doses of vaccination, that's kind of the key thing. What's a, what's a non-political issue? Should you put pineapple on pizza? And so the idea was, oh, no, it's going to offend the Italians. I mean, the Italians are going to say this is cultural appropriation, uh, you know, racist. Uh, don't put pineapple on, on pizza. And then the Americans would say, look, this is America. You know, don't restrict my pizza topping freedom. Um, and then you, you buy bots to, to amplify both, both sides uh, and disrupt societal discourse. Of course, they don't do it with pineapple pizza. They do it with race issues, with abortion, right? Um, and so uh, it's a funny game like that, but it inoculates against the real thing. And that's basically, you know, we, we show people these posts, fathers don't deserve a day and Father's Day. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, this is, this is real news. Uh, some Trump uh, guy got killed uh, with his uh, nine-year-old daughter who were hunting, and somebody else has 1.5 less megabillies in the world. At least they died supporting their beloved Second Amendment. I think the point is, even though that, uh, you know, this is a tragic sort of thing, uh, it's very polarizing, right, this, this type of rhetoric. And so, again, we find that, you know, people find this stuff less reliable after playing in the inoculation group. They're more confident, and they're less willing to share this stuff with, uh, with other people. Um, here's a photo of cats. This is an interlude. Um, now we, we have a we have a game called uh, called <laughs> called Cat Park, um, which is a new game with the U.S. State Department, which is about radicalization and conspiracies. And uh, you know you you find yourself in this uh, new hotel room. There's good news is that you have a, a new place in a new town, but there's bad news is you have no friends. Um, and so uh, you meet the sinister lady in the bar and who tells you that, you know, there's an elitist cat park that's being erected. Um, um, but it's all very suspicious because there are no cats in cat park. Um, unfortunately, there was a mem memo that got leaked by the U.S. State Department and I became the target of many conspiracy theories online because uh, I wrote, uh, with the Internet, only two things are certain, the global appeal of cat videos and the pervasiveness of disinformation. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, uh, there were some people from the former Trump administration on this, uh, on this email list. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they did a deep dive into Cambridge, a uh, misinformation guy um, who was, uh, you know, controlling everyone with uh, cat videos. Um, so basically, that, uh, that was the, uh, you know, the Biden administration funds cat park game to inoculate youth against disinformation. What a scandal. Um, and so, um, you know... Just sort of to give you two final examples, uh, inoculation doesn't just sort of extend to, um, to these issues, but also uh, things like extremism. So uh, terrorist organizations use a playbook, uh, and uh, they use the same tactics over and over again, and you can actually deconstruct them and inoculate people. So one of their playbooks is this, uh, which is that you uh, identify vulnerable targets, so who's unemployed, who, who's not in school at the moment, maybe a, a relative died, somebody is vulnerable, um, gain their trust, isolate them from their network, and then activate them to do something bad. Um, so we had some colleagues in uh, Lebanon and um, Iraq, and Nabil and Fadi, who run the behavioral science uh, units there. And they, they know these tactics. They know what happens to youth. Um, and so we did a lab study with the radicalization game, where basically you're recruited into an extremist organization called the Anti-ICE Freedom Front, and your goal is to melt the global ice caps. Um, but it uses the, the same, you know, it's kind of a you know, safe environment, but it uses the, the same techniques. And we found that it works. But, you know, the, the reviewers said, look, but you're not demonstrating this with actual vulnerable youth. And so Fadi uh, was able to set up an actual trial in, uh, in Iraq um, uh, where, um, you know, we worked with youth uh, in areas formerly occupied by ISIS. Um, and so, um, you know, we did this experiment there with young men and uh, basically found that, yeah, they were, they were better able, you know, using simulated WhatsApp conversations, trying to recruit these people into extremist modes of thinking, they were more likely to, uh, to resist it. Um, we've done some, some agent-based modeling to try to understand, you know, how, how does this approach work at a system level? You know, assuming there's some people broadcasting misinformation and you have a network structure, can you really inoculate the whole network? You know, what thinking about herd immunity, what percentage of the population. You know, our effect sizes are small. They're not like, you know, uh, uh, 
Pfizer level uh, immunity, right? It's a, it's a it's a small bit, and so it wears off over time. And so, how much can you really achieve at population level? Um, and so, we ran some some interesting simulations, and you know, the, the takeaway of this is really is that. Um, if you do this inoculation kind of 20% at a time, you know, different time points, um, this is, uh, these are the amount of, uh, of, of rejecting uh, false information, this dotted line over here. Um, you really see that you would have to, so, sorry, so this is an environment that's truthful, this is uh, mixed, uh, and this is mostly false information. And so over many simulations, we sort of, and, and combinations, we try to figure out what's happening. And the, the basic conclusion from this is that you need to be inoculating pretty heavily at time zero uh, in order for the network not to be consumed uh, and converge in an echo chamber really with, uh, with disinformation. So it needs to be upfront and not sprinkled throughout because then it's less, less effective. Um, and so in the, in the last sort of stage, Google approached us and said, look, we, we like this science experiment run amok, but uh, um, you know, on social media, the game, it's just not feasible. We need something, something quick, something short. Um, can you do videos? And they said, Google said, look, we own YouTube, right? Uh, uh, YouTube is not also not news, true, false. It's, it's, it's gurus radicalizing people using rhetoric, right? And we need to expose this rhetoric in advance and, and inoculate people. Um, but um, we're, we're not so keen on uh, talking about immigration and climate change. And, and uh, you know, can you create a weakened dose that has zero risk? Um, you know, basically like a truly inactive uh, vaccine. You know, we don't want to be arbiters of truth sort of thing. So we had to go back to the drawing board and um, think about, uh, well, John Rosenbeek went back to the drawing board because, uh, um, you know, he, he, he has all the good ideas from uh, popular culture. Um, in fact, we share the, the same sort of 80s uh, humor, and so uh, I'll tell you a story about that in a second. Um, but basically the, the script for the videos was always the same. So forewarning, you may be targeted on YouTube. Um, here's uh, you know, what scapegoating minority groups looks like, uh, here's a weakened dose, and then some further examples to help you spot it to make sure that you know, you're really getting this and you're developing the right resistance. Um, and so that really was the approach of the videos. Um, and then um, Google's big idea was, they said, look, um, you know those annoying ads on YouTube that you can't skip? We could put the pre-bunk there, right? So algorithmically, you can, you can, you can automatically impute pre-bunks and scale that across billions of people. That fixes your opt-in problem with people wanting to learn about fake news uh, and, and it's equal for everyone. So we don't single out certain groups and so on because they have you know, political concerns and things like that. Um, and so that, you know, that was, uh, was attractive to us. So that was really interesting. So what went into these videos? Um, um, so I'll show you that in a second. So we did six pre-registered trials uh, in the lab. And then science said, uh, uh, okay, survey stuff, uh, that's cute, but um, you know, we really want evidence from social media that this works. So we went back to YouTube and Google. YouTube doesn't really work with outside scientists, so, so we had to go through Google. And they said, uh, you know, we really need to do an experiment on, on YouTube. Uh, it took about a year, you know, lots of lawyers, but, but they let us do uh, an actual experiment on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, to actually test this approach uh, in the wild. Um, and then we added that, and then we finally convinced uh, the editor of this uh, Science Advances that this was uh, worthwhile. Um, so you, you're basically inoculated versus control, and then you get either a manipulative social media post that uses one of the techniques or a paired neutral version of it, and we're looking at your, able to, your ability to discern between the two. Um, so here's our weekend dose. John came up with Star Wars. Um, so false dilemmas are huge in misinformation. So false dilemmas are things like if you are uh, pro-Palestine, you are anti-Israel. If you are pro-Israel, you're anti-Palestine, right? It, it tries to take away all nuance and create an extremist uh, mode of thinking. Um, you know, National Rifle Association in the U.S. would say during school shootings, like if you're against automatic rifles, uh, if you're not supporting automatic rifles, you're against the Second Amendment, um, right? So, so it's always taking away the nuance. So what is a weakened dose that doesn't talk about wars or, or, or guns? Um, so here we have uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi talking to Anakin Skywalker. From, this is Revenge of the Sith for people who are into Star Wars. Uh, um, so Anakin Skywalker goes on to become Darth Vader. Um, and Obi-Wan says, uh, you know, Anakin says, if you're not with me, then you're my enemy. 
And then Obi-Wan says, only a Sith deals in absolutes. And then the narrator of our video says, you know, don't join the dark side, right? Don't use these manipulation techniques. Um, and that's kind of the idea. Um, for scapegoating, we used a clip from South Park. If you know South Park, uh, they always blame the Canadians for everything, uh, which, you know, it resonates with the U.S. Uh, sort of audience. I'm not sure what we would use in the, in the U.K. Um, but here are the examples of them. We give people real social media posts. Why help illegal immigrants? Uh, you know, we should be helping uh, homeless Americans instead. So that's a false dichotomy. So the neutral version would read, uh, hey, maybe we can help immigrants and homeless Americans, um, right? And so that's, uh, those are some, some sort of uh, examples. And then the experiment was actually done in the ad spaces. Um, so we got like 30% randomly for one question. We could iterate the question so we don't have item effects, but uh, within 24 hours of being exposed to a video. So either on YouTube, uh, you know, this was in the U.S. for people who consume political news, Either they saw the inoculation video, one of our inoculation videos, or a control video about freezer burn. And within 24 hours, they would be prompted with a test to see if they could. What's funny is that these companies have billions of, of dollars, but, but their scientific testing is limited to multiple choice questions. Uh, that's basically the, the, their capability in terms of uh, testing people. So, you know, it's not perfect, but uh, we know that uh, we don't do it with students because we know you can guess, uh, right? But, but the idea is that, uh, that we try to give uh, more difficult and, and less difficult options and, and, you know, to try to do our best with this. Um, but basically, so this is from the lab study, so this is manipulative, the blue uh, discernment is in red, so people became more discerning, right, more confident, uh, they found it less trustworthy and they shared it less. Um, this is uh, not always significant because there's floor effects with sharing in the lab. You know, people don't tend to admit that they're sharing anything. Um, but mostly this was all highly consistent. In fact, the effect sizes were really big. Look at the Cohen's D. I mean, we're talking 0 0.6, you know, in social psychology this is, this is pretty large. But then, you know, once we go to the YouTube study, here, here are the effects for all of the items combined. So about a 5 to 10% boost in technique recognition in discernment of these techniques uh, across the, the whole. So there's actually a big difference between you know, the effects in the lab and effects in the wild when people are distracted on social media. So I was a bit disappointed about this 10% boost at first. But then I learned that advertisers spend millions on ad campaigns on YouTube hundreds of millions for a 1% boost in their brand recognition. Uh, because they know that a 1% you know, recognition of Coca-Cola leads to hundreds of thousands of revenue. So actually YouTube says 10% for an ad lift, as they call it, that's huge. Um, and so if you were a company, you would be making lots of monies. Um, and so unfortunately I'm not a company and, uh, and um, you know, so um, I'm not making any money. But um, the idea was to educate people, right? And so what we were hoping to achieve was um, getting them to do this on a larger scale. So YouTube actually refused to implement this as a, as a mandatory sort of thing. Because um, even though the weakened dose was, was really weakened, they, they still were too nervous about, you know, uh, doing anything to help educate people against misinformation. Um, um, but it hasn't stopped Google. Um, so Google's did this in Germany, so they reached over half the German population uh, online with this approach. You know, decontextualization, fear-mongering, whataboutism, replicating this on their own, about, you know, five, six, eight percent. It depends on the country, depends on the audience, but it's all, it's all pretty similar. Um, and they're going to do this ahead of the uh, EU election campaign uh, uh, soon. Google's one of the only ones persisting with this in, uh, you know, in face of the, the war on truth and uh, politicization of, of misinformation. Um, and um, you know, we did some stuff with NATO during the uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine. Um, Biden used it uh, to try to pre-bunk against uh, Putin's invasion. In fact, I mean, this is based on intelligence sources that I have no way of verifying, but they basically said that um, you know, by, by preemptively releasing the fake videos and inoculating people and telling them these are actors, tr you know, pretending to be on Russian soil, this is all fake, you know, you shouldn't believe, you know, shouldn't believe this. It actually delayed the invasion by a couple of days. So that would be the most convincing evidence of a pre-bunk in the real world, but of course, you know, it's based on, uh, on, on what, they, what they tell us. Um, we do have a Ukrainian version, we have a Russian version, and we've just released the Hebrew version uh, and seeing how things go in the, uh, the conflict there. Um, some propaganda of my own, as, uh, as John mentioned. More importantly, we have a textbook coming out with Cambridge University Press soon that summarizes all of what I just said. So thanks so much for listening. We must pre-order 15 copies for the library. <laughs> yes, if only they would do that. Many thanks indeed. Uh, we have a tradition in the Zangle Club that we have a break now while people who have to get away. 
Yes, yes. Hopefully it kept, um, kept people away. Um, I should keep this on. Should we, for, questions. for questions. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yep, yep. Basically, you know, the one thing that I found interesting in reading about these things is that if you don't trust your source, basically no amount of debunking is going to help you. You would just dismiss it as oh yeah, they're just a meta you know, they're trying to to even persuade you even further from. So but what you seem to be showing is that it basically works in, in the context of the population. So You mean in terms of people's baseline susceptibility to misinformation or the, the baseline no, availability the baseline of... view of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you, what you take as being yeah, yeah. acceptable source of news and yep. going to Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have both. Uh, there's empirical, some empirical evidence and some anecdotal evidence of, of doing this in the real world. So I think, you know, empirically... I like to think of it on a time scale, and so you know the, the ideal situation for um, for pre-bunking is uh, purely prophylactic, right? So before people have bought into any misinformation, that's hard to guarantee in the real world. Um, so that's kind of uh, you know how this originated was in a highly artificial kind of lab setting. That's where the idea came from, right? And so the challenge was how to how to then look at it. And so we typically find that. Um, um, you know, if you follow the viral analogy, the, the incubation period can be quite long. Um, and so for people who are exposed but quote-unquote not yet infected, it can still work, which is what we call therapeutic inoculation. Uh, but then people who have already bought into the disinformation and don't have any trust, it doesn't really work on them. Um, and so that's, I think, kind of where, where, where we're going. Um, you know, in the beginning, I did some experiments on climate change, but I haven't shown you here. But basically what you see is that even amongst those who deny climate change, uh, it still it still worked in in um, helping them uh, reject a a new myth, but it obviously doesn't reverse uh, any of their thoughts about climate change uh, not you know being being a hoax. So there's there's a, a kind of minimal thing that you can do with those audiences. Um, but the YouTube videos, we looked at the interaction with baseline conspiracy mentality, and we found that it was non significant. Um, so you know didn't. It didn't backfire, but it also didn't particularly work for them. Um, um, but that is, is something. So a lot of these approaches tend to make people low on trust even angrier. Um, and so what we typically find is that inoculation, especially the, the, the one that focuses more on, on manipulation, it doesn't seem to uh, upset the conspiracy people, the people who are low on trust too much. But obviously it also doesn't help them that much because they've already gone down the, uh, the rabbit hole. So in practice, the challenge is like, how can you target this at people who are either not exposed yet or, or have been exposed or are at risk in some way, right? Um, so with the WHO, they were able to target ads you know, on, on Facebook with audiences they think might be susceptible. Um, you know, YouTube does something similar. Um, we're now moving towards an idea that uh, Yara and a group had called precision inoculation, which is actually um, uh, tailoring the inoculation to people's baseline sort of susceptibility, um, so kind of almost like <laughs> reverse micro-targeting people uh, with the inoculation. Um, and then another, another approach is really to, uh, um, to, what I always say to social media companies is that they have knowledge of baseline susceptibility. So they, they, you know, they could target this much more efficiently than we ever could, but obviously there are privacy concerns in revealing who's been exposed to what. So I think practically it's a very difficult um, problem. So a lot of discourse revolves around um, trust and like how to maintain trust, how to make people not more distrustful. Um, and so I think, I think ultimately targeting this um, 
uh, and presenting it in a way that sort of maximizes uh, uptake. So the vaccine analogy also has this interesting like adjuvants that are used to, to, to make sure your body is more likely to you know, uptake the vaccine. I think we have to do something similar for distrustful audiences. So we've tried to look at who the inoculator should be. So here from the anecdotal experience, you know, doing this with the WHO, the UK government, you know, some people are clearly saying the WHO is fake news and like, you know, the government's fake news. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, 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 so you don't, you're not getting to these people. So you need a different, uh, a different source, a different inoculator. So who are the sources that they trust and can we present a different type of source? So we've tried things uh, with influencers, for example, who are now doing the inoculation. So in India, we've tried to use a local comedian who is uh, non-polarizing uh, as the, you know, maybe the right inoculator isn't some formal body that people don't trust. But there's actually very little on, um, on source and inoculation. Uh, the EU did a campaign finding that uh, putting the EU logo on it didn't make citizens trust the EU less, but it also didn't boost trust. Um, so yeah, this trust question is really interesting in terms of who, who is the right inoculator in what context and for whom and how can you target this in a much more efficient way. Um, I think that's kind of the next level of how to implement this. Yeah, but, yeah. but I don't have a satisfactory answer for how to, how to do it. Yes. Yeah, just following up on that question. Um, I, you mentioned that you interviewed people that were like former yeah. students, stuff like that. So do you have ideas on how to like apply this to like new radicalization? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So, so um, you know, um, and, and uh, builds off the point that was just raised. I think when, when I do a lot of the book talks, people always ask me about what can I say to my you know crazy uncle who believes in conspiracy theories. Um, but the, the thing is, like, the inoculation approach is more for, for the bystanders, right? Uh, not your crazy uncle, but everyone else, really, uh, to make sure that they don't fall for whatever the crazy uncle is saying. Um, um, now, working on the crazy uncle is a, is a whole different ballgame. Um, and so uh, we find that inoculation doesn't upset the crazy un uh, uncle. Uh, but um, de-radicalization is much more difficult. So I'm actually thinking of writing the next book on, on de-radicalization because it... it, it uh, you know, it requires many more structural things. So you have to you have to give people a new social network. So talking to the former extremists, right? I'm curious as to what made them less extreme and how they found their way out. And a lot of the answers were about, well, you know, I came across this uh, this other influencer, or um, um, the the most surprising thing. So one of the guys, uh, his name was Caleb, who was into far right misogynistic sort of YouTube stuff. Um, all of a sudden wandered onto this channel called ContraPoints by a transgender influencer. Um, and, uh, you know, she was, what, what, this is what they call algorithmic hacking. So she was, she was um, talking about the same points as, let's say, uh, um, what's this guy, Andrew, Andrew Tate or uh, uh, Jordan Peterson. So they were talking about the same things, but in a way that provides a different point of view. Um, and he, he was really intrigued by that. And so he started getting into unfortunately a different echo chamber um, but ultimately that sort of led him to, to de-radicalize but um, he he goes in and out because he doesn't actually have a support network uh, so he, he sort of re-engages with these extremist communities from time to time because you know he doesn't have a lot of support he lives in a remote area uh, another conspiracy theorist uh, um, that I actually invited to come give a talk uh, at Cambridge uh, in May uh, his name is Brent. He was a conspiracy theorist uh, for 15 years, and he lives in, uh, in Bristol. Um, he talked about um, how it just became too implausible, that some of the things people were saying just seemed too ridiculous, and he started, you know, Googling alternative sources. And, um, uh, but he was really brave, again, because he got isolated from all of his friends, all of his family. You know, he was the only one who wasn't believing. And, and so de-radicalization actually, you know, normally requires giving people a new network, uh, right? Uh, you need to have support, you need to have friends, you need to have alternative information. Um, it takes time. You can't push people too much. It, it goes, like, very slowly over, it's, let's say, a year, not like something you can do with, with a quick inoculation. Um, and there's a lot of interesting research on, on how to de-radicalize people. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that's a whole, a whole different ball game that takes a lot more time. I often talk to people, including my own extended family, um, where uh, it's repeated, repeated interactions, don't push people too much, uh, giving them alternative ideas and alternative connections, and then maybe over the course of six months or longer, people, people kind of you know, de-radicalize de a little bit. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an intense uh, sort of process that's much more difficult. That's why I stress the prevention metaphor so heavily uh, because, you know, for most people, uh, de-radicalization attempts are not successful. Uh, and so, uh, 
Um, and I should say, I hadn't talked about this, but inoculation, in theory, could be used in nefarious ways. Uh, so one, one example is that of uh, so extreme cults uh, sometimes use it. So, so people who are not allowed, uh, who live in a cult, who are not allowed to, you know, leave the cult, they will sometimes say like, oh, don't go into, uh, re you know, into the city because people will say to you this or that. Um, however, you should know that and so on. So and they actually inoculate people against facts uh, so that they don't leave the cult. Um, so I think this is a tool that's not inherently good or bad. I mean, the aim is to use it in the public interest, right? Uh, and to make sure bad actors don't use it. But, but there are some bad actors who, who can use it to radicalize people uh, or actually to, to, not to radicalize people, but to prevent people from becoming de-radicalized by, you know, uh, what's called meta-inoculation. So you can inoculate against an inoculation. Yep. Context. That was yeah, good point. No, 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 it's a good question. I wasn't very clear on that. So that was uh, in Sweden, that was, uh, those were students, uh, most of the students we look at in the UK and Sweden are between 16 and 18 um, due to ethical uh, issues because, uh, you know, we don't, our lab doesn't work with kids. And so I, uh, you know, we mostly uh, have ethical approval to, to just work with you know, adults or adolescents. And so, so well, I think 16 is the, the limit uh, for, for psychological research without needing parental cons consent for these type of interventions. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we want to do, because we have a kid's version, and it would be really interesting to look at data from, uh, from kids, uh, younger kids and teenagers, uh, really because the, the thinking is that, you know, our ideologies are not as crystallized when you're younger. So kids are more open-minded, they're more flexible in their thinking, they're less rigid. Uh, and so, you know, teaching them about how to spot manipulation online before we actually become adults who go on social media seems like the most valuable thing and where it could be the most effective. Uh, and so certainly we're talking to a lot of schools about how to implement pre-bunking and inoculation uh, in national educational curricula. Um, I think that's probably best done in a way that doesn't tell students what to believe, but rather how to spot these sort of larger manipulation techniques. Um, and it's interesting, so in the Netherlands there's some traction with that, in Finland and Sweden there's, there's some government mandates on you know, letting the schools decide how, but, but basically that we need more education about propaganda from a very early age. And it's about more than critical thinking, right? Just critical, you can be, you know, when you find psychology experiments, you can be a critical thinker, but you're not accessing the relevant skills in the moment, which leads people to be duped. Um, and so you really need to sort of simulate, okay, what, 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 how do people make conspiracies? Expose them to a conspiracy. How do you, how do you deconstruct it and practice that so that when it actually comes, you know, in, in a conversation somewhere, you can immediately identify it and say, what's going on. You know, Flat Earth is another one of those examples. I once had a conference with 300 disinformation experts and I asked, who here can tell me why the Earth isn't flat? Uh, and only one person raised their hand uh, because, you know, everyone knows it's false, but in the moment they can't actually tell me the physical mechanisms for why that is the case. Um, and so I think the problem is not, not being able to access it and that requires sort of simulation and rehearsal. Um, and that's what we should be doing with kids, I think. Um, and so that, um, yeah, I'm definitely, but you know, both in the UK and the US, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's political. So it's, uh, it's more difficult to, to, to get people to agree on what should be in, in educational curricula. But certainly um, some, some European countries are, are doing it. And we need more large scale tri uh, trials with schools to try to figure out how, how effective it is. Deborah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Not yeah. But I think people would be surprised to see that motivation didn't change the decay of the. That's what basically what we found, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. So, could you say more about that? How do you measure motivation? How do you know if you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And it's kind of controversial because, you know, in the inoculate, the people who, the small, the sort of, you know, the researchers who are really into this, they, you know, the, the, the leading explanation was like motivation for, for inoculation. And they thought memory was just kind of a, a, you know, I should say that the controversy is because 
you know, when you inoculate somebody, in, like in the game, when you inoculate somebody against conspiracies and then you show them lots of different variants, right? So it's a broader spectrum sort of thing that you show them lots of different variations of conspiracies and people become more immune. So the, the logic goes, well, if it was just memory, then when you present stuff they haven't seen before, it can't just be explained by, by memory. That's kind of the counter argument to, to memory. Uh, but in, the, in these studies, we measured memory with um, sort of self-reported memory and then objective memory tests. So we asked, you know, do you, what do you remember from the video or from the text, uh, either multiple choice or open-ended. Um, then we had some other probes uh, about inferences, about what people read. And then motivation was, um, uh, we also did some semantic mapping of, uh, of, of people's memory networks using kind of, you know, top of mind associations and things like that. And then motivation was uh, more about um, how motivated are you to, to, you know, want to defend yourself from misinformation? How motivated are you to use the lessons that you've learned to identify manipulation? Um, do you feel like, you know, you have... Uh, interest in, in doing this and that's kind of uh, that's kind of what these skills do it used to be measured by straight up um, discrete emotions like uh, how fearful are you or you know how scary uh, do you think this threat is uh, on your attitudes and that was came from the health literature where the idea was that the inoculation should kind of scare people so that they they respond which was this older idea in health psychology that public health campaigns need to be scary so people take action but then later people found that that's actually not you know, scary messages kind of demotivate people more than, than anything. And so it needs, to, it needs to be motivating in some way. And so that's why it's now sort of asking more about how motivated do you feel to do this or that. So that's kind of the motivational measures. Our boosting of memory was kind of simple, right? So it's just the, the, the lessons are rehearsed in a video or something like that. The motivation boosting was more done with uh, trying to elicit some affect or emotion or some sort of, uh, um, you know, you know, do you the funny part of the video, or do you want to play a little bit of the game again, or you know, remember that uh, you know we should all be motivated. So it, it's possible that we weren't that successful at um, eliciting motivation, but the manipulation checks show that motivation is higher. It just shows that that at, at time thirty, it doesn't predict anything. Um, Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things that we were that we thought of in the future, maybe we should do a, a physiological measurement of, of emotion or motivation to see how predictive that is. Um, because yeah, it's true. I mean, there is no there is no objective measure of motivation in that context, so we'd have to come up with one. Uh, but that's a good point because the memory has a lot. We have some subjective memory measures, but most most of the ones we use that were actually predictive were the objective ones. Um, and so that's, that's a good point. Maybe there's a more objective indicator or a behavioral task or something, uh, a more objective indicator of motivation that we could use. Because, um, you know, I suspect that, I mean, my, my thinking was that motivation should be important besides T0 or T1, uh, but, but yeah, it wasn't. Um, and so, yeah, either it, it doesn't matter as much or, or we fail to, to stimulate it uh, in, um, in the right way. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Maybe we can chat more about that. Uh, yes, I don't know who was who was first. Uh, should we go, Miriam, Julian? Is that is that all right? Yeah. Sure. I was just wondering um, whether, with the like vaccines becoming more um, politically polarized, did you ever regret the kind of comparison of the psychological approach with vaccination, or did it ever make that harder mm. to pitch when uh, trying to convince governments that this is actually a really good approach? Yeah, it was actually funny. It was actually kind of funny because there were um, you know the, there were some conspiracy articles about like oh. You know, Van der Linden came up with this uh, vaccine analogy just to sell books or whatever. But but you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's funny because uh, you know this analogy has been around since the '60s, right? And so they weren't thinking in the '60s that people would be vaccine hesitant and not you know like the psychological sort of variant. But what I find in practice is that epidemiologists and virologists love this inoculation metaphor because you know they're also thinking a lot about science communication and it comes natural to them. Um, whereas people who are vaccine hesitant obviously don't like this uh, analogy so much. Um, and you know social media companies are somewhat aware of that. So Google um, in all public communication uses the term pre-bunking. Uh, instead of inoculation, because they they also do focus groups with um, you know their target audiences on on YouTube, um, 
and they find that pre-bunking is a, is a term that resonates better than inoculation with, the, with people low on trust. Um, so, you know, they did focus groups with Gen Z and millennials about our videos, and they were like, uh, hmm, Star Wars, South Park, this must be targeted at old people. Um, and so, you know, obviously for, uh, for, for TikTok, so, you know, going into TikTok, we'll have to find different examples, because basically they told us, look, uh, TikTok generation is not going to do the a minute and a half Star Wars video. 